Able's in on air is sponsored by Green Mountain Support Services, empowering people with disabilities to be home in the community. Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support comes together. Media sponsors for Ableton On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, U.S. Press Corps, Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Partners for Ableton On Air include Yachad, New York and New England, where everyone belongs. The Orthodox Union. The Vermont Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired. The Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired. The Montpelier Sustainable Coalition. Abel Dinonair has been seen in the following publications. Parkchester Times. New York Parrot Online Newspaper. Muslim Community Report www.thisisthebronx.info and www.h.com Ableton On Air is a member of the National Academy for Television Arts and Sciences Boston, New England chapter. Hello and welcome to this edition of Ableton On Air, the one and only program that focuses on the needs, concerns, and achievements of the differently able. I've always been your host, Lauren Seiler. I'm Arlene Seiler. And before we get to our important show today, let's thank our sponsors, Washington County Mental Health, Green Mountain Support Services, and many others, including the support from the Association for the Blind of uh, Vermont and the Division for the Blind of uh, Vermont, and many others. Um, we would like to welcome our guest today, Zachariah Watson, if I'm saying that right, Zachariah Watson, of uh, the Executive Director of Habitat for Humanity of Central Vermont. And we, today we are talking about uh, housing options for people, with, uh, for people with special needs and for people in general, for, for people with special needs. Welcome to Able Then On Air. Thanks, Larry. Thanks for having me. Okay. Um, tell us the missions and goals of Habitat for Humanity. So uh, Habitat for Humanities has been around since 1979, and their vision is creating a world where everybody has a decent place to live. Mm -hmm. Now, when you say decent uh, place, I know during COVID now it's been really hard for people um, with challenges or people in general to find um, decent places to live. Um, can you explain how Central Vermont is working towards that goal and change, maybe changing things, um, especially for people with disabilities and housing? Certainly. Uh, so the pandemic has certainly raised awareness about the shortages of housing in, in Vermont, especially in central Vermont, and especially with the recent trend of wealthy urbanites moving into the state and paying well above asking price for properties. It's, it's really made it apparent that there is a need for housing not just for the homeless which is homeless which has been on the radar a lot recently but also for low and middle income vermonters so <clears throat> how does it work how does the whole thing work with um because you know owning a house isn't easy yes you have um the challenges of maybe a small of a, a small apartment but how does owning a house, you know, because you have a mortgage, you have to do certain things with that, lots of paperwork. So oh, yeah. go, go into, like, the, some of the challenges that people might face and how, how you help kind of hammer that away or, or, like, so people don't be, people are not scared. Absolutely. And I, <clears throat> I think it's important um, uh, to, to mention that when Millard Fuller started Habitat for Humanity International in 1979, his goal was, uh, it was his mission, um, he was a, he's a Christian man, and it was his mission to provide um, housing for income-sensitive folks. And the way he, he designed his program was essentially they would use volunteers 
to make the house affordable. Mm -hmm. uh, they would then create a 0% interest mortgage that those funds would go into a revolving fund so they mm -hmm. could continue to build housing for the next person. Um, so housing in the United States uh, is majority of the, sorry, most Americans, their number one asset, their number one source of equity is their house. Mm -hmm. and, um, and what that is, that's peace of mind. Mm -hmm. It means that you have something to fall back on. You have, a, you have your own equity, a substantial amount of equity. Mm -hmm. So when things get financially difficult, you can draw on that in the form of a home equity loan or something like that. So when folks don't have a home, they don't have that, that peace of mind. They don't have that financial equity. Um, in addition to all the other things that we associate with home, um, we, uh, we recently did a poster design contest mm -hmm. where we asked kids in K through 6 to mm -hmm. draw their idea of home. And for adults, we think of a home as, as that financial equity. It's that peace of mind. Mm -hmm. But for a child, it's uh, memories. It's, it's the holidays that you spend. It's mm -hmm. time with your family. Um, you know, quite simply, it's the best place ever. So there's an emotional investment that comes with home um, that if you've never had a home, then you don't have that experience. And um, Yeah, because living on the street is not the greatest place in the world. No. It's n and, and that impacts your, your, uh, your, sus your, systemic, your relationship with your community. Your systemic way of, yeah. Exactly, yeah. And it uh, you know, impacts your health, your emotional well-being, your trust in the society and the social safeguards and nets that are there. So um, not having a home, and whether it's homelessness or being housing insecure where you know, your folks are constantly renting in a market where rent is way above uh, what anybody can afford to pay with our current minimum wage. Um, mm. And so yeah. if you're bouncing from house to house, you're, you're never going to have that You mean that like couch surfing or? Couch just... surfing or even just rentals. Um, you can't afford your rent for a couple months and your landlord boots you out. Mm -hmm. And so then you have to find another place and you lose your, your, uh, your, down, your down payment on, on, on the house uh, that you're renting. It's, uh, it's a major drag on somebody's finances and it prevents them from ever being successful. Last question before my wife asks a couple questions. Um, what's, um, what is equity? Define equity uh, in, in terms of what you're talking about so people can kind of understand. Yeah, ex sorry. Thank you for asking, Larry. That's good. So equity I'm referring to is their financial assets. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it's so like I said, in this case, it's the house. It's how much money you've paid towards your mortgage. Mm -hmm. um, and that amount that you've paid towards your mortgage, that you own that amount of the house, plus the value of the appreciation of the home as well. Which is, Can you give me an example? Well, so, um, so through us, we have a shared equity model where mm -hmm. an individual, we provide a mortgage for our homeowners that's based on what they can pay, yes. not on the actual value of the home. Yeah. Um, and then if they choose to resell that house mm -hmm. down the line, they receive 25% of mm -hmm. appreciation in addition to the amount that they've actually paid towards the mortgage. Uh, you want to ask question, a couple questions? Go ahead. Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> Take your time. Uh, how many houses have you built so far? Since 1989, we've, construct, we've built, rehabbed, or recycled 30 homes. Uh, what wow. does it mean by rehab? Uh, rehab is uh, it's repair work. It's um, you have an existing structure that you're working to build up, bring up to livable standards. Um, mm -hmm. Surprisingly, about a third of the houses for sale right now in Washington County are mm -hmm. for very low-income families. Mm -hmm. But but you buy the house, you get it for really cheap. But then you need to put fifty to a hundred thousand dollars of work into it. It's not actually affordable for somebody that's low income. Um, so, yeah. uh, so rehabs are an important part of the future of affordable housing in Vermont. We have a lot of old housing stock that needs some work uh, mm -hmm. to make it so it's livable for. I could imagine, yeah. Right. Okay. Now, in terms of access, since we talk about accessibility here, um, let's say example. Let's say someone who is special need, who works, and wants other options in terms. of not having an apartment because so to be honest with you um uh, mr watson in my opinion um small apartments are not conducive to people with mobility impairments so how can habitat for humanity or how does habitat for humanity make a house accessible um 
for people with special needs who want that house? Um, <laughs> excuse me. Take it well, um, so we actually don't design our house until we find our homeowner. Mm. And that means that whoever we select, depending on their family size, their accessibility issues, we design that house for that person. Mm -hmm. And so if somebody with mobility challenges applies for um, our program and they're accepted through our home ownership program, we would make the house universally accessible. Um, hallways, or barrier free. What's that? What's the difference between that and barrier free? Uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not really sure. Ba okay. Um, that's, uh, well, barrier free means like, uh, like accessible bathroom. Ah, yes. Um, larger room so wheelchair can get in there etc exactly so universally accessible means that all the hallways are a certain width um all the uh the outlets are a certain height it mm -hmm. means that the bathrooms have um stress bars that somebody can can use either in the bathroom in the um, bathtub or next to the toilet there's a bunch of specifications that you need to meet to make a house universally accessible um and obviously uh Two stories doesn't make sense for somebody that's in a wheelchair. Uh, so how do you? So ideally, we would we would design a single story household, mm. um, mostly because additional options for bringing somebody up to a second floor can be very expensive. Even with one of those um, lifts, yeah, air, they they do have them. Yeah, and but the, you know they're ten fifteen thousand um, dollars, and when we're trying really to, just for absolutely, a lift? they are very expensive. And so for uh, for and we're always trying to make the home as affordable as possible, uh, so uh, so that we can continue to build more houses. So we look into all those things to design the house for the needs of our homeowners. Well, uh, Any go go ahead and ask more questions. Have you ever built a tiny house? Because because they have in Washington County they have tiny houses. So what's the difference between a house? And in a tiny house, or uh, like with your partners, like what are some of the partners that Habitat for Humanity has with um, building a house? Like, uh, do you work with Wheelpad and some other? Uh, so most of our houses, are, I would say, majority of them are single-family households um, that have three bedrooms, one and a half bath, and about twelve hundred square feet. Um, so we have never, we've never built a, a tiny house before. It's wow. something we've. We've considered, um, so I think for us, the concern with a tiny house is the resale value. Um, so what, what does that mean? Well, so we want, our, we want our homeowners to receive some additional appreciation on their home. So mm -hmm. the house gets more valuable over time. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure what the appreciation value of a tiny home is, but if it's anything like a mobile home, mobile homes actually go down in value, whereas mm. a single family house on a slab or foundation their the value will almost inevitably go up even after a housing market collapse so a tiny home there's the risk that the house will actually lose value over time and that that means that that equity piece that we talked about earlier mm -hmm. it means that they're actually losing equity on their home they're paying towards equity and then the house's value of the house is going down i don't know if that's necessarily the case for tiny home i could be very wrong about that um but it's not the same thing as wheelpad, the accessory, accessory dwelling units that you're referring to. Those, um, that's an entirely separate thing. Okay. Now, in terms of misconceptions, what? A, no, they have this old prejudice thing, uh, uh, acronym, not in my backyard. Hmm. Okay, which you've probably heard before. Okay. So, uh, what are some of the misconceptions around people with special needs now that if someone wants to rent a home is there any you know uh, situations that might be in their way or or people not giving them a chance like land, you know how landlords they they pick and choose who they want to live in uh, in their apartment building but as, what are some of the misconceptions that might be around home ownership and people with disabilities so if any? I'm, I'm 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 not aware of those i'm and it's and it's not because they probably don't exist. It's, but what I can talk about is NIMBYism, not in my backyardism, around um, having, a, having a low-income homeowner. Um, we, we have had if I said the wrong question, I'm No, sorry. no, that's, uh, I, I can talk about what I'm familiar with, and that's, that's the low-income families, which, uh, you know, if we're, we work with low-income families, somewhere between 30 and 60% of area median income. That's 
a family of four making twenty-five to forty-eight thousand dollars a year. Mm -hmm. um, we know that there is um, there are folks that are opposed to having low-income houses in their backyard, and it's for their own. It, it's for the interest of their equity. That I think there's some fear that by having a lower income house in their neighborhood that it'll bring down the value of their home that's 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 it's a, not it's not the person living in that home it's the home itself the home itself i mean there are certainly misconceptions about um the the type of folks that might be low income mm -hmm. um and and those are misconceptions like mm -hmm. i said they're they're you know there's fears of um you know uh, drugs or something like that or, or you know so those uh, those are just it's fear and it's not accurate um, our homeowners they uh, they spend 250 hours of their own personal time building their household they have, so they are they literally have sweat equity in their home yeah so what exactly is that? yeah they, they come they we they go through a financial wellness course with us that we partner with downstreet housing and community development on um, they actually come on the work site, they bring their friends and their family, they build their house. It's, uh, they put their own sweat into the house. So there's a financial, inve there's a sweat investment in addition to they own the home, and which is way different than renting mm -hmm. because it means that they are really building their equity. They're part of that community. And so I think that there might be some fears around low-income neighborhoods um, you know where there's rent, where there's a high percentage of rental rates. Mm -hmm. um, that's not the same things you see from home ownership. Okay. Um, go ahead uh, with more questions, um, Arlene. Mm -hmm. uh, did, go ahead. Take your time. Uh, section eight. If somebody has that here, section eight. Do you, do you accept vouchers for the house, or mm -hmm. how would that work? We look at all forms of income, um, mm -hmm. and so that could be Section 8. Um, it could be Social Security. It could be child support. Um, it needs to be verifiable, and it needs to be considered consistent. Um, you know, we well, are... Well, Social Security is consistent. Absolutely, yeah. That is a consistent point of income. Yeah, absolutely. So as long as there's a, his, a history of receiving something right, or an right. expectation of receiving it in the future, then we will consider that as part of your income. You know, we're, we're not a handout program necessarily, or not at all, excuse me. Like I said, we have the sweat equity. And while we are a non-traditional lending, we, we, we do provide mortgages to individuals who typically wouldn't qualify for a traditional bank loan. Um, and that's because we look at all these things. Is that because of credit or? We look at credit somewhat, but it's more about, that's about giving us a, an idea of where to look in somebody's finances, mm -hmm. but um, where banks typically rely a lot on the credit score as well as your debt to income ratio, we're looking mm -hmm. at a lot of other factors right. that we believe to con uh, can show that you are going to be a good um, more uh, homeowner. Well, what are some reasons that landlords don't like to rent to people, or or, or well, you you know, because uh, they're like if they have. Um, um, bad, bad credit. Bad credit or, or a criminal record. Um, do you guys look at any of those things to work with folks? Uh, we do look at their, we, our homeowners um, have to, the, one of the other requirements is that our homeowners need to be in need of housing, mm -hmm. um, which means that, you know, their housing is too expensive. It means that they're in an unsafe conditions. They don't have uh, adequate resources like kitchens or enough bedrooms for their family members, um, or the rent is too expensive. Um, so, or, we, or the apartment is way too small. Or the apartment's too small. We look into a number of things um, that really qualify somebody as being in need of housing. Uh, we do ask for references from current and, and past landlords if you've been somewhere for less than two years we ask for a reference from the previous landlords um, we understand that uh, you know that, that that there are not always great relationships with landlords and the individual we're working with um, it's not the only factor we look into but for us um, our organization depends on our mortgages so that we can continue to pay uh, to to build more houses right Mm -hmm. And so we do need to make sure that um, we are verifying that we're working with somebody that has that really wants to be there, 
um, that is really in need of being there and, and that is going to be a reliable partner with us because it is a partnership. Okay. Uh, any more questions before we end? Because we only have a couple more minutes. Arlene? Okay, I lost her. Um, I lost her. Um, what is the future um, with uh, Habitat for Humanity um, going forward and with the sweat equity and all of that? What is the, uh, the future goals of Habitat for Humanity? Uh, great question, Larry. So we are currently working on a house in Barrie. It's our first uh, home rehabilitation. So it's a 1920, so it's a 100-year-old Victorian four-square wow. um, that we are converting into a high-performance energy standard home. That means that, our, um, that the homeowner will pay very little on heating and cooling of their home. This is one of our goals that we will continue to strive towards um, in all of our future builds is that they are all energy efficient um, with high efficiency appliances. Like an is, is that difficult taking an older home, like you said, 1920s? Yeah. So is that, is that a, the more, it, so basically the more older the home, is it more difficult to do things? Absolutely. Well, rehabs have their own issues. You know, every wall you open up, there's a new issue that you run into that you weren't expecting. Older homes um, have demolition. Uh, what about, what about, well. let's say, if, uh, just an argument, so uh -huh. let's say you're working on an older home and you happen to be, you know, you have to, if you have to go through a wall to fix something and then all of a sudden you see this rotting wood and you see, uh, Bugs. Uh, uh, no, I know that's a horrible word. Uh, termites or whatever you want to look at. How do you deal with those things? Uh, we are fortunate in Vermont. We don't have termites, so that's one thing we get to avoid. Uh, no, we have to. We rip it out. We replace it. Uh, the house that we just did in Barry had a whole back section, um, the, about 800 square feet, two-story uh, part that was uh, structurally unsound. We had to go in and tear the whole thing down. Um, the wow foundation was uh, basically stones with some granite right on top of dirt uh, that is not stable. We were surprised it had been, a, it'd been standing like that for 100 years, so we had to go in and build interior concrete foundation walls with a vapor barrier and insulation so that we're insulating the shell of the home and making it sh making so that that house is going to last another 100 years. So yeah, it's, wow. it's very challenging, um, but you know this is the future. Uh, the other challenge that we run into, Larry, and to get back to the accessibility issue is not every home is going to be, uh, every rehab, we're going to be able to make uh, universally accessible. Um, so this is a two-story house that you have to go up a steep incline to even get into the entrance. Mm -hmm. For us to make this universally accessible, we would have had to have built a 40-foot ramp um, for it, which can be challenging and very expensive in addition to the second floor. So this house wasn't a good candidate for somebody that was needed a universally accessible home. Fortunately, our partner homeowner uh, didn't need that. But we do strive to make all of our homes at least visitable, meaning that uh, your grandparents or when you get older, um, you can still enter the home uh, if you do have some mobility challenges, but it doesn't. we don't need to make the whole house universally mm -hmm. accessible. Any last questions you want to mm -hmm. ask? Uh, no, not at the moment. Okay. Well, we would like to thank you for joining us on this edition of Ables and On Air. Um, uh, any place where people can, can contact you, what is the website? That, Certainly. The website, yeah, we are uh, always number. looking for uh, volunteers to help out on our build. We are a volunteer-run organization. That's how we keep our houses affordable. And no experience is necessary, just a willing heart. We provide all the training. Um, and uh, so you can... You can access us, um, you can get in touch with us through our website, which is centralvermonthabitat.org, um, or call us at 802-522-8611. Uh, we love to have individuals as well as groups, employees, um, communities. Say that number one more time, please. 802-522-8611. Uh, okay. Well, um, please, um, please uh, partner with Habitat for Humanity uh, for more information. In, uh, the number is 
522-8611. That is 522-8611. And you can go to www.habitat. Is it Central Vermont? Central Habitat. Vermont Habitat for Humanity dot org. Central Vermont Habitat dot org. Dot org. Sorry. Central Vermont Habitat dot org. That website once again is Central Vermont Habitat dot org. Well, I'm Lauren Silas. I'm Arlene Silas. See you next time. Abled in On Air is sponsored by Green Mountain Support Services, empowering people with disabilities to be home in the community. Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support comes together. Media sponsors for Abled in On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, U.S. Press Corps, Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Partners for Ableton On Air include Yachad, New York and New England, where everyone belongs, The Orthodox Union, the Vermont Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired, the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, the Montpelier Sustainable Coalition. Able Din on Air has been seen in the following publications. Parkchester Times, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, and www.h.com. Able Din on Air, is a member of the National Academy for Television Arts and Sciences, Boston, New England chapter.